Dr. Craig, we lost a great leader and thinker not too long ago. Back in November of 2019, Philip Johnson uh, died, passed away. He had suffered a couple of strokes. Uh, is it fair to say that he was the leader, or that he was uh, the driving force behind the ID or intelligent design movement? Or I think, think in one sense that would be fair to say. He wasn't the leading intellectual by any means in that movement, but he was a sort of um, galvanizing force, uh, a figurehead that helped to organize and propel the movement. He called together uh, theologians and philosophers like yourself, scientists and others, to try to get together uh, a think tank, I guess, in the movement. And a lot of this happened at Biola. Do you remember some of those days in the early 2000s? No, that was before my time. I was in Europe um, until uh, 1994. Mm -hmm. And then um, we returned to the States in 94 to take up my teaching position at Talbot. Before I came back, however, in 1994, there was a conference organized at Cambridge University at Queens College, as I recall. And this conference uh, featured a number of young uh, Turks involved in the intelligent design movement, including um, Stephen Meyer and um, Michael Behe, mm -hmm. who was publishing a book called Darwin's Black Box, and um, several others. Um, I know Dembski was involved. I don't remember if he was at that conference, but certainly his name was involved. Um, Meyer, Paul Nelson, and Bill Dembski were sort of the triumvirate working together to construct a compelling case for intelligent design. And Phil Johnson was at this conference, and he was sort of the motivating force and figure uh, behind it. And Michael Behe was a newly discovered darling of this movement for the book that he was writing. I read the book that uh, was Philip Johnson's uh, most notable book, and that is Darwin on Trial. And um, I just remember it having an effect on me in my life. And I thought that uh, the, I, I thought that ID was a juggernaut, and it just wasn't going to stop, you know. And I had a chance to interview uh, Phil Johnson, but it was after his stroke, and, and I remember how hard it was for him to articulate what used to be very fast and rapid fire. And so it was, uh, and, and as I understand, he often wondered why God allowed the stroke. He said, we're just getting going, God, mm. on this ID. Why, why now? But then he entrusted God yes. and said, God knows what he's doing. But <clears throat> he wasn't, he didn't want to be the main leader anyway. He wanted to be more of a facilitator. That's right. He was a sort of, if you will, a political leader or figurehead. And he knew that he would need to <clears throat> gather top quality um, biologists and scientists in other fields if they're going to make a good case for intelligent design. He said he remarked that the book, though effective at laying out criticisms of Darwinism, would by itself never have been enough to unseat Darwinian control over science. Um, <clears throat> and speaking of that, Bill, I've, I've often heard that he was kind of disappointed. He thought that he would see a complete wipeout of Darwinian evolution. He thought that this would do it. That, yes, you know. even before he had his stroke, Kevin, I remember hearing him at conferences where he had compared evolutionary theory to a huge leaking battleship that could not stay afloat and was doomed to sink eventually. And he came to realize that, in fact, that sort of optimism for intelligent design was overblown and that, in fact, the evolutionary paradigm was not sinking and was not going to succumb to the sort of criticisms that the ID people were 
making of it. I myself wasn't surprised by this. I mean, do you really believe that secular science is going to abandon an evolutionary perspective in favor of saying it's the product of intelligent design? Mm. That's just la-la land. I, I, of course not. They're not going to adopt a, a, that sort of paradigm in the place of evolutionary science. And yet that did seem to be Johnson's expectation and hope in which he was disappointed. Another disappointment of his, according to this article from William Dembski, <clears throat> he also expected that Christians would be uh, would get on board and get on board with the book. And he says that the rank and file, the layperson, tended to, yeah, they, they, they embraced it. But he was disappointed in Christian academics uh, who would not embrace ID like he thought that they should. And I'm wondering, Bill, and this is your area, I, I'm just wondering if that's because you have a pressure to be taken seriously, and even if you're a small Christian school or you're a Baylor University, a Baptist school and everything, you want to be taken seriously in the academy, and a lot of them weren't willing to embrace any of this because they wouldn't be taken seriously. Yes, and I think that for people like Howard Van Til uh, at Calvin, it was rooted in a sort of philosophy or theology of nature that was quite unbiblical. Um, Van Til wanted to argue that God has created a world that has what he called functional integrity. That is to say, it just gets along fine on its own without the need for supernatural interventions. In other words, no miracles. And so, although Van Til would want to affirm things like the historicity of Jesus' resurrection, um, it's hard to see why one would adopt a view that presupposes that God doesn't do miracles. Um, Alvin Plantinga has been very effective in criticizing the theory of divine action that underlay the views of people like Van Til. Um, look at planning his book, Where the Conflict Really Lies. And I think his chapters on divine action and his critiques of people like Van Til and others who want to prohibit God from acting in the world of secondary causes is just devastating. So while I could imagine that Christian scholars might well be convinced by current evolutionary biology. Um, they might think that indeed this is the best account of the origin of biological complexity. I don't understand why they would adopt a theology of nature that would be so inimical to the Christian view of God's action in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, William Dinsky says that Van Til's position was is a theistic naturalism, which he resisted, but then nowadays he pretty much embraces uh, that. He's, it sounds he's like an oxymoron, yeah. doesn't it? Theistic <laughs> yeah. naturalism. But they recognize the existence of God, but boy, God had better not get his hands dirty mm. in the series of secondary causes in the universe. It, it is a deistic view where the creator and designer of the cosmos just doesn't get involved in that sort of miraculous activity. Dembski also said that uh, what Philip Johnson did well was to look at Darwinian evolution and Darwinism and so on on its own terms. And um, he, rose, he raised the conversation there a little bit, and, and in fact it made it um, at least somewhat more respectable in the academy because at least it was dealing with it mm -hmm. on its own terms. Yeah, evolutionary scientists are often very self-critical about their theories, and they recognize the uncertainty and conjectural nature of much of it. Um, and I think what the intelligent design movement did was it decoupled intelligent design from 
theology. Um, people like Dembski and other intelligent design proponents have been very clear that they are not arguing for the existence of God, um, but simply wanting to make an inference to intelligent design as the best explanation of biological complexity. And the designer could be extraterrestrial life forms who created life on this planet, or the designer could be someone in a super laboratory in which we exist as a little microscopic world and they're tinkering with our world. Hmm. There isn't any attempt to um, prove uh, theism or that this is God who is the intelligent designer, just simply that the design hypothesis is the best hypothesis for explaining biological complexity. And so they really tried to decouple ID from the old creation versus evolution debates uh, by disassociating themselves with creationism. Sure. I thought it was kind of funny. Uh, at one point, Dempsey said that Philip Johnson said, out. Oh, Email is going to be a really big thing. I want you guys to start emailing <laughs> each other <laughs> and keep in touch and so that we can share the ideas and share the research uh, and so on. But, you know, um, Bill, I guess the, the biggest brick wall was the Dover trial. And uh, to this day, now Dembski in this article says, no, that was a bump in the road. But... Boy, if you just kind of look around a little bit, people say Dover put put an end to ID. Uh, the Dover trial yeah. was ruled as non-scientifically and fundamentally religious, and therefore unconstitutional. A lot of people thought that was not fair, and that's not what they wanted to do. Like you just said. Yes, right. It, it was a sad state of affairs because the intelligent design movement people themselves did not support the teaching of ID in the schools. This was a local initiative by some local person, and they were opposed to it. They said, we are not ready for this yet. Um, the movement is still maturing. They were opposed to this happening, and so um, the verdict was not really altogether surprising. But intelligent design is primarily an intellectual movement, not a political movement. The idea of teaching ID or creationism in public schools was never one of their aspirations. So if Dover has closed the door on that, that does nothing to deter uh, intellectual inquiry into the origins of biological complexity and arguing that um, the input of an intelligence is necessary in order to explain how this could happen. I did notice, though, in this editorial that in the same way that Philip Johnson became discouraged because ID had not carried the day and evolutionary theory did not collapse under its own weight, Densky himself says, uh, my tone these days would be much different I'd be more sober and less triumphalist about ID's prospects. I'd have warned that things might not unfold in ID's favor nearly as quickly or easily as my tone suggested. Um, but none of this, he says, is to diminish Phil's monumental impact mm -hmm. on the ID movement. In fact, I noticed something that Dembski said later in the article that I have wondered about, namely, he, he used to be publishing so frequently, and I haven't heard his voice in recent years. And I see, he says here, my own pursuits have largely turned to business in the last few years, so I don't keep up with ID. I was surprised. As I used to. To, to read that. I, <sighs> I, I, I thought that he was one of the, the horsemen. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and he was for a long time. Yeah, and now he's um, a businessman and doesn't even try to keep up. That That is just an enormous loss for the movement. It's, I think it's lost its chief 
figure, and now the mantle seems Chief to have fallen. She's mathematician, for sure. Yes. Yeah. It, the, now the mantle seems to have fallen to Steve Meyer at the Discovery Institute. Um, but what a terrible loss. I mean, I, I think the loss of Bill Dembski is far more significant than the loss of Phil Johnson. Yeah. Phil Johnson was, as I say, a political leader and figurehead, but Dembski was, I think, the leading intellectual of the ID movement while he was writing. Bill will conclude with this paragraph that uh, I think sums up a lot that, that Dembski writes. He says that Phil Johnson was also a prophet, and sometimes prophets can rub us the wrong way if they call us out, especially accurately, especially if they're telling the truth. He says here, like Francis Schaeffer, a generation before him, Philip Johnson has put his finger on the key place where our generation has forgotten God. For this generation, it is the place of our origin. To a generation that regards God as increasingly distant with nature as all there is and humans as mere appendages of nature. Johnson, the prophet, points us to the true God, the one in whose image we are made and to whom we must ultimately render an account. I would say that that was Phil Johnson's uh, spirit as well. I think that what Dembski is getting at there is Philip Johnson's claim that if you assume naturalism to be true, then evolutionary biology is the best explanation of the origin of biological complexity. Uh, he said, I'm quite willing to admit that the best naturalistic theory uh, of biological complexity is the one given by evolutionary biology. But he said, why be a naturalist? He said, unless you have some argument or proof of naturalism, how could you exclude that there might be a supernatural designer and creator of the universe? In which case it is no longer obvious that the blind evolutionary story is the truth. 